Welcome back. I am Ari Melber in for Melissa Harris Perry. 781 days. That's how long American hikers Shane Bauer and Josh Fatal were in jail in Iran on espionage charges. Shane spent four months in solitary confinement, an experience so defining that when he did make it out and back home seven months later, he began investigating how we use that same punishment here in the U.S. He found many people who think we over incarcerate and over punish. And in a new report from Mother Jones magazine, he describes how many are rethinking our criminal justice policies, including some Republicans. Now, to understand this reevaluation, I think you have to look at how we got here. Today's broken, overcrowded, and unjust prison system can really be traced to this moment, June 17th, 1971. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. Even then, though, few understood just how much offense the government was about to play. Republicans led the way, and many Democratic politicians followed suit. That included Speaker Tip O'Neill, who reacted to the overdose death of Boston Celtics star draft pick Len Bias with a big anti-drug campaign. Democrats wanted to look tough on drugs that campaign year. And that campaign, which started with an emphasis on enforcing the law, became an arms race for who could pass new laws. By 1986, that led Congress to pass the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, which authorized very long jail terms for nonviolent drug use with mandatory minimums. It passed the Senate by a vote of 97 to 2, with 46 Democrats on board. And that policy, forcing judges to put users in jail, often regardless of their individual situation or any mitigating circumstances, well, that drove today's prison realities. A prison population of more than 2.4 million people. That is more prisoners per capita than any other country ever. It's a number that has quadrupled since 1980 alone. And those numbers have gotten so bad, we are actually now living through a pretty remarkable backlash to the backlash. The over-incarceration crowd is retreating. Years of civil rights organizing, including the argument that these policies are unconstructive and racially unjust, coupled with expensive prisons and tight budgets, are driving what I think is a revolution, and it has two parts. One, a rejection of the 1980s-era politics of crime and fear and over-incarceration and stigmatization and criminalization of even minor drug offenses like marijuana use. And then, number two, a serious embrace, and this is important, of alternatives to prison, treatment, education, specialized courts, and really grappling with recidivism, something we should all care about. That is why President Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder embrace sentencing reform, like executive action to reduce mandatory minimums, and a new system to consider commuting the sentences of people who are still serving time under the old crack cocaine disparity. And it's why some Republicans, to their credit, are changing gears. Look, this is a good example. Here's what Newt Gingrich said to the New York Times in 1992. We have to build enough prisons so there are enough beds that every violent criminal in America is locked up and they will serve real time and they will serve their full sentence and they do not get out on good behavior. Shane Bauer flagged that in his Mother Jones article, but in 2011, here's what Gingrich said. There's an urgent need to address the astronomical growth in the prison population with its huge costs and its loss of human potential. We can no longer afford business as usual with prisons. It's not just former politicians either. The 2012 GOP platform, written by RNC members, uses what I think is a structuralist critique of prisons, that it's not only bad people who become criminals, but bad laws that categorize people as criminals. Look at the platform's prison reform section. It says, quote, the resources of the federal government's law enforcement and judicial systems have been strained by unfortunate expansions, the overcriminalization of behavior and the overfederalization of offenses. New bills from Republican senators Mike Lee and Rand Paul, both with Democratic co-sponsors, propose drastic reductions in mandatory minimums. Now, how are those bills doing? Well, you may not have heard about this, but the Senate Judiciary Committee just passed the Lee Durbin Smarter Sentencing Bill by an overwhelming 13 to 5 vote. And unlike most bills in D.C., it's ready for a full vote on the Senate floor. Reforming the criminal justice system is never politically easy. We have a failed war on drugs in this country. It was started by both parties. And there are signs it may be ended by both parties. Our panel today reflects some of the revolution on this issue. Judge Tim Lewis, who was appointed by President George H.W. Bush to the prestigious Third Circuit Court of Appeals. He's received many awards, including recognition in the Best Lawyers for America list for regulatory law and the Minority Bar Committee Award for the Pennsylvania Bar. 
Again with us, Advancement Project co-director Judith Brown Dianis, Judge Billy Murphy, who served as a circuit court judge in the city of Baltimore as a criminal defense attorney. He's been named one of the top 100 trial lawyers in the U.S., as well as Reason Magazine's Peter Suderman. And on remote, Shane Bauer, the investigative journalist behind that Mother Jones piece, joins us from Boulder, Colorado. Welcome to you all, Shane. Let me start with you. Your previous pieces looked at solitary confinement in America. Now this piece, you're looking at the Republicans changing their position. Why? Well, I think it's interesting uh, that right now, you know, after three decades of kind of a massive rise in our prison population, that we're seeing a shift. In 2009, our uh, you know prison population start falling, uh, and you know a lot of this is actually coming from conservative policies. Texas's prison population has fallen 20% uh, since 2007. Um, you're seeing you know people like Newt Gingrich, Rand Paul call for a repeal of mandatory minimums and. You know, this, they're kind of uh, shifting a lot of conservative states right now. There's a group called Right on Crime that's really kind of leading the way in this. Yeah, and you mentioned Rand Paul. He spoke about uh, Judge Lewis, who's here at the table. Let's take a listen to that and get your response. Federal Judge Timothy Lewis recalls a case where he had to send a 19-year-old to prison for conspiracy. What was the conspiracy? The young man was in a car where drugs were found. I don't know about you, and this is Judge Lewis, but I'm pretty sure one of us might have been in a car in our youth at one point in time where there might have been drugs in the car. Judge Lewis, your take there? You know, um, when Senator Paul made those remarks, I uh, got a call from a colleague of mine at my law firm who said, I never thought the day would come when Rand Paul would be <laughs> quoting uh, Tim Lewis. Um, but. I think that for those of us who care deeply about this issue and have been writing and working and fighting for reform, we don't care where the support comes from. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to people like Weldon Angelos, who's uh, serving 55 years in, in federal prison for selling marijuana on three occasions, an amount that, uh, a total amount of $350 worth of marijuana, uh, because he had uh, a firearm, allegedly, uh, on his person at the time. Weldon Angelos doesn't care that it comes from Senator Paul, Senator Durbin, Tim Lewis, or anyone else. But this is a, a welcome convergence, I think, of uh, ideologies uh, at a time when more, greater bipartisanship is truly needed. Um, I think that uh, Senator Paul and many on the conservative side of the aisle uh, have recognized that it is very difficult to make the argument that one is for less government and less government spending and not be in favor of prison reform and other means of, uh, of um, uh, reducing what has become a significant problem. Mm -hmm. Peter? Um, I think that the, you know, the interesting thing about this issue is that no matter how you look at it, when you look at the facts, regardless of your ideology, regardless of your desired outcome, uh, the conclusion is pretty clear. We are spending too much money and locking up too many people. The federal prison system is right now operating at 136% of capacity. It's on track to 155%. I mean, that's just not sustainable. The Rand Paul, uh, Mike Lee, Proposals are uh, supposed to be are supposed to save about two and a half billion dollars and reduce prison bed uh, usage by uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps over the next couple of years. Um, I mean, this is the sort of thing that needs to be done. And uh, regardless of where you come from, this is the sort of thing that you can see the case for. Yeah, and Shane, bringing you back in here, I mean, Peter's speaking uh, from the vantage point of writing for a libertarian magazine. Uh, they have been consistent on this for some time. Uh, it is really mm -hmm. the, the politicians who have finally found the conservative arguments here, right? Right, yeah, and I think, you know, there's, if you look at the, the polls in Texas, for example, uh, Republicans in Texas in a recent poll uh, were 80% in, in favor of drug treatment over incarceration for, for drug offenders. Um, you know, and then you have a situation like in California where you have a Democratic governor that is uh, resisting reforms. You know, and last last uh, summer, Jerry Brown vetoed a bill that would have reduced uh, sentences for low-level drug crimes. Um, and you actually had conservatives, this right. group right on crime, that was lobbying for that bill in California. And I should mention, um, Shane, to your point, not just cost, but uh, but Judith, also to the issues of 
the impact on communities right. of color. Rand That's Paul right. quoted Michelle Alexander to talk about this as Jim Crow. Yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, I mean, the collateral consequences for communities of color. I mean, it's devastated our communities from not only the fact that people are being taken out of our communities, but on top of that, at the end of the day, they lose their voting rights, they have um, a hard time finding employment on the other side, and so we have all of these other impacts that disproportionately impact um, people of color and communities of color. I'm glad you mentioned voting rights because the Obama administration actually has a new proposal on that that we are going to get to. I also want to thank Shane Bauer for your reporting and for joining us from Colorado. And still to come, Orange is the New Black author, the real-life Piper Kerman. But first, the impact of Attorney General Eric Holder. That's next.